What's up, Spokane? Welcome back to the Milestone Squadcast. My name is Sean, and I am here with Tamara Bush. Mm -hmm. um, our other co-hosts, Philip and Jennifer, are not able to be here today, so it's just us two. Yep. So welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. You want to give us a little bit of background info on yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I just go by Tam, make it simple, make it easy. Um, I live here in Spokane, and I'm currently a PhD student at WSU, so go Cougs, even though I don't follow college football, but it's all good. <laughs> um, and I'm just happy to be here, invited to talk about fatherhood and fatherlessness, and awesome. um, that's basically what my research study is about nice. on a personal and professional level. Yeah, so uh, last time we were talking about how we're taking time to expand and unpack this topic of fatherlessness, mm -hmm. um, we didn't feel like we can really make an impact and do justice to that issue mm -hmm. by just having one episode and one show. Right. So this is the second one, um, or the first, actually. <laughs> actually, many. it's the first. Of many. To yes. Come. <laughs> um, so you are studying about fathers and fatherlessness. That's correct. Wow. So how long have you been doing that? Um, I started my program back in 2013 and actually was pregnant at the time with my second. So yes, I was commuting back and forth from Spokane to Pullman, because my program is in Pullman. And um, it actually wasn't something that I just started. It actually fell in my lap. So mm -hmm. taking it a little further back, I'm all about language and culture. And so I did a master's degree in ESL, English as a second language, and bicultural education. And um, I'm very much interested in how lang language plays in culture, whether if it's verbal or nonverbal. Um, I think that more of what how we communicate with other people is by our actions, not necessarily by our words. Nonverbal. Nonverbal. Mm. Body and language. Body, all all body language, oh, all body language. And so um, I was actually gonna go the geeky route and do educational psychology. So it was all about the stats and numbers. I'm a, I'm a numbers girl, love it all the way. But as time comes on, I was talking with my, um, my professor and he was uh, mentioning about vulnerability and I'm like, vulnerable who? No, mm -mm, we're not even going there. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I'm like, I'm not going to be opening myself, you know, as a book in, in that kind of way. And when you're in this program, like in a PhD program, it does put you in a in a spotlight in a very different way. And you start looking inward uh -oh. of various different things. And exactly uh -oh. right. It was uh oh. <laughs> and um, so I, I ignored it for about like a year. And then finally, something fell like in my lap of an experience of something I read in a book. I, I don't remember what book. All I just remember, it just impacted me. And I'm like, you know what? This is where I need to be. So little by little, I just ventured out like kind of like a groundhog just peeping out every once in a while <laughs> to kind of see as to if this was something that I needed to do. But as a person of faith, little by little then things started coming to me so i saw i was tugging on exactly. your heart exactly so do you real quick do you remember what that that line was in that book or whatever actually no actually no really i don't all, all i know is like i'm just gonna follow god just, just took that and just put it right on your just heart continue, just continue wow and so um i started talking with dads whatever i was whether it was at the park you know at the grocery store and what have you and just by giving like words of inspiration and encouragement i noticed i was captivating them and i'm like i can't speak okay my husband will laugh at me with this i say manies like their language <laughs> manies manies <laughs> and so um language in language <laughs> And so um, as a result, I started to pick on buzzwords as to what was said to me to kind of reflect it back to whoever I was talking to. And I, you know, asked a few people that I knew that were in Spokane just to talk with them about fatherhood. And um, it was kind of on the verge of fatherhood and multiculturalism, too, because I myself am in an interracial marriage. And so not only dealing with that kind of unpacking of father fatherhood, but also a cultural 
as well mm. too, so that I added another piece to it. So um, as I started to talk with a lot of men, I come to find and realize that there was an underlying thread. And the thread was that um, there are things that they were never taught or role model, and a lot of it boiled down to um, forms of emotion, forms of vulnerability, and also value and value. Yeah. And so, wow. yeah, so here I'm right now just. So you mentioned English as a second language. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you're not from this country? Originally, no. <laughs> you say you're from far away. So from where far, is far that? Far away. Originally, I'm from um, St. Lucia, the island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean. Really? Yeah. I, I don't got have a an homie accent. from St. Vincent. Really? St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. Do I, you, you know about that place? Mm -hmm. okay. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, plus, I, I actually um, more uh, connected to Barbados because my grandparents were in, in Barbados, and I would travel every summer with my sister and I to go visit our grandparents. So, so you grew up out there in the Caribbean? Um, kind of. Until it, I was at the age of five, and then my mom, it was just my mom and I, and that's the story behind that, we moved to England, and then from England to the United States. Wow. And so as God was putting this on your heart and you were starting to like just connect with guys in the community, were you doing any reflection on like your childhood, mm -hmm. Big your time. experience? Big time. And then even like the culture of England and then where you're from? Um, not, not so much England, but more so the Caribbean, because we do have a lot of women that are single mothers. And my mom, she was one of them. And I don't know the whole story behind why my biological father and her weren't together. But, you know, my mom had me and then eventually she had my sister. And then it's a whole other story down the road. But um, I just remember that as a child, even though I had male mentors like uncles that were in my life, I always yearned to have my father. You always yearn to have your and my where father. is he? Why is he not here? Well, he died when I was 16 years old, so that won't ever happen until I get yeah. to see him again. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. And so you probably dealt with that though up until that point when he passed, like through your childhood. Where is he? Why isn't he here? What happened? Actually, it, it actually hit me more when I was a teenager, and even today, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say I don't have like, you know, dad issues, you know, as an adult. But it's just that how can I turn that pain into something that I can be able to be hopefully a help to others um, for dads that are out there, regardless of where you come from or where you're wanting to go, but to be that integral part in a child's life, in your child's life. Yeah. And even you're not with the mother or you know the spouse or however that relationship you have, to always be a part of that child's life because you matter and you're very important. 100%. Um, so I want to go back to, like, it sounded like you were on this journey and God put this thing on your heart mm -hmm. and you were starting to kind of explore it a little more. And obviously now um, you're going for your PhD. Mm -hmm. And so how long ago was this when you were talking about that, that situation um, or that time? Uh, well, that was probably about like four years ago when it kind of like knocked me in the head with where I needed to go. And, you, you know, when you struggle with God, you fight. You just fight. And that's what I did for <laughs> yes. a little bit. And you then finally, with God. Mm -hmm. and then it was just like, you know what? Then there were times I didn't want to read anything. I didn't want to do anything. And then where it came more um, t like in my face is when I met people, when I met dads along the way. Like recently, a few weeks ago, I met a dad in the park and he was asking me randomly enough about how he can be able to be more prevalent in his daughter's life because he was a stay-at-home dad and his wife was working and so I just gave him a slew of resources and encouraged him like hey you know for your daughter she's a bright young you know little girl but you want to up your ante a little bit but just remember you're just as important in her life as her mom is you want to say so, that again and look in the camera and say that to anybody that's listening? Oh, definitely. So for you dads out there, you are just as important as the mother of your child is. And you can you can be able to do whatever you set your mind to. So don't wow. think anything different. So based on that statement, would you say in regards to like your research that men feel uh, devalued, mm -hmm. fathers feel devalued and mm -hmm. unnoticed, unappreciated. Mm -hmm. Very much so, especially um, like looking here in the United States. I mean, if you look at a lot of programs, they're geared towards women. I mean, hands down, even here in Washington State, you know, if something happens between a husband or the wife or spouse or partner, they tend to go towards the women than they would go to the men. Not saying that the man is not able to um, do just as good or even better, but it favors the women. And I'm not saying in a way like, 
they're not as capable, but we got to at least have some type of a common ground somewhere, not in the middle, because I don't think there is a middle. You just have to have some form of a common ground yeah. so that both parties are able to be prevalent in that child's life and not use the kid for leverage. Mm. Say that again. Do not use the child for leverage. I, that's one thing that really irks me. I, I say it this way. The adults can figure their stuff out, but don't mess with the child. Just, yeah. Yeah. So what happened that caused you to, um, like, you're writing something, a thesis or so, of some right, sort? Right now I'm in the beginning stages. I'm in the prelim stage. So that's basically having your questions and then more research towards the writing before I get to the dissertation part of it. The so. dissertation, that's yeah, the word. The big dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> that just sounds like a big old it's work a of lot. research and it's a lot. time spent. It's a lot. So what brought you to that point to, to want to write that dissertation on this topic? And you mentioned in your email fathers um, and, and fatherhood in the 21st century. So that's like mm -hmm. a huge. It's huge. That's um, a mission right there. That's a call. No, it is. Life. It is a mission because of I just got tired or just like this is where like the mama heartstrings got, you know, pull a little bit. When you hear stories and you see stories of children wanting to be with their dad and moms or, you know, what have you, that because of whatever emotion that they have within, they will use their child as, as basically bait, you know, if they want to get back with the person or get at the person for whatever that has happened. And on top of that, it goes even deeper. Look at our society today. You have children that are health-wise obese because there's a father not prevalent. It's mm -hmm. not saying the factor, but it is a factor. You have issues where there are a lot of youth getting into trouble. And when you hear their stories, what's the common denominator? A dad is not in their lives. Absolutely, yeah. Um, for um, those that are faith-based, you know, um, sometimes that can be used as well too. Like even in the Bible, it says about the fatherlessness that God can be your a father, father to the, the orphans. Mm -hmm. He's a father to the orphans. Yeah. yeah, and I struggle with that, though. It's it's more of like, well, you're not physically here. You need to be tangible. Like, mm -mm. But, you know, it's a journey everyone goes through. That, that's the faith part mm -hmm. of it. The it's a journey. The of faith, mm -hmm. yeah, to believe. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like that's something a lot of people struggle with, mm -hmm. um, with God being their heavenly father. But uh, it's, it's like... Uh, it's almost like you can only have a relationship with him if you call him on the phone, which True. means you pray. Exactly. If you text him, like you're praying, you right. know what I'm saying? And right. then like reading about him mm -hmm. in, the, in the Bible mm -hmm. and, and uh, even like he, he, will, he would meet you where you're at. Exactly. You know, um, I, I've had a lot of moments like that, especially coming back here um, after my marriage fell apart and like crying out to God, like, what am I supposed to do now? What am I going to do with my, about my life? And and I'm hearing him say, give me time. Mm -hmm. And then throughout a, a, t a period of time, for the first three or four months that I've been back, people have been speaking to me, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Exactly. Um, and that was over and over, and I read it in books, and people were telling me that. And then one of my brothers at church he he said it again out of nowhere and I'm like there goes that verse again mm -hmm. but there's a thing in that a word in that right like so we were especially in our country we're people of instant gratification right like we want it now right. and everything's Wait. at the click of our finger or mm -hmm. the tap of our phone exactly and he's he pointed out the word work mm -hmm. all things work together for the good of those who love God yep. and like just knowing me and my recovery, I've been in recovery for two years. Praise God. And it's taking work. Yeah. That work means time. Exactly. A lot of tears, a lot exactly. of lonely, dark nights. And like, God, I need you. The devil's trying to tell me to kill myself. And then he reminds me of my son and why I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And so um, that's something else I want to get into because there, there's a reason also why a lot of men are not allowed in their kids' lives. Mm -hmm because I was abusive to my son's mom. Um, she doesn't trust me and feel that I'm safe enough for him to even have conversations with me and, and, and um, um, video chats mm -hmm. because of the trauma that 
that I exposed him to through right. the abuse. Right. Right. And so I can't see him or talk to him or have direct contact with him or visits till next year in August. Okay. And like to a lot of people that sounds harsh, mm -hmm. but they weren't there. Right. And I look back and I remember like all my struggles and my issues and my sins coming out and manifesting and what I did to her and everything right. I did to her. Right. All the abuse, all of it <clears throat> in front of our son and while I'm holding him. That is horrible. Like mm -hmm. that man is sick. Mm -hmm. He needs help. He shouldn't be around his kid till he gets better. Right. And so like I'm not fighting her on that because it's if and it's both, right? Like mm -hmm. so there's studies that show the impact on a child when they are not in their father's lives from the ages of three to five and then so forth. Mm -hmm. But then there's also studies that show the impact on a child when they are exposed to abuse and trauma. It's both. Mm -hmm. And we can stand on her on one side and me on another side with, with these professionals that have studied this stuff. Um, and, and we're both right. So now what? You know what I mean? And I had to go to God. I was fasting for a week, five days straight with no food. And I don't know why I'm fasting, but he told me. <laughs> and then he told me to do it. So I started doing it. And then when, um, yeah, so she emailed me with this whole, uh, her terms, right? Right. Uh, of this parenting plan. And I was like, oh, God. Now I know why I'm fasting. And I don't know what to do. I know what everybody's telling me to do. Take her to court. That's not right. You're going right. to win in court. Fight it. Right. Fight her. And I'm like, I don't want to fight, though. And God was like, don't. You don't fight like the rest of the world does. Well, what about my son? Trust me. I have a plan for his life. So me being able to send him videos and not see him or talk to him, those videos are for him to see me anytime he wants and just talk to me, right. hear me talking to him. Right. Video chats were more for me because he's only three. Mm -hmm. And his attention span, he's going, to hey, daddy, and go back and play. But can I ask you a question? By you doing those video chats, did that also put you in a place of realizing how you need to work better for him, for his long term? All the time, all the time, you know, and, and that's what God used to give me humility and peace to, to, to grant her what she's asking for, mm -hmm. not fight her, not take her to court and, and do this crazy work with him, mm -hmm. like work, mm -hmm. work, stuff where I just cry, cry myself to sleep like oh man I'm remembering all these things and experiences with my own dad and and then even like the homies I grew up with they don't have their dads around and the fathers that a lot of guys grow up to become and uh, yeah and, and then he told me imagine the kind of man you're going to be who you're going to be at the end of these 18 months so let me turn another question to you. Throughout Hold up, are you interviewing I'm me? I'm interviewing you okay, now. Okay, I'm just moment. making sure. I'm uh, just clarifying. just a little bit. <laughs> so with that being said, with the experience you had with your father and also your homies that they didn't have fathers, at any point in time, did you learn how to express yourself emotion-wise? No. No. And um, if you even thought about it, how'd that make you feel? What did you think of yourself? Or what did your... There was a, an experience when I was younger I was a kid. We were living in New York, and you live uh, in New York. Yeah, upstate New York. Oh, I lived in the city. Oh yeah. I grew up in Brooklyn. <laughs> BK. Oh, Shout out of Brooklyn. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> really? Yes, I did. That's what's up. Yeah. That's what's up. I got homies from out there. Um, so this conversation that I had with my mom, it, it left me feeling like I was wrong about everything, mm -hmm. all of my reactions, what mm -hmm. I say, what I did, and 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 then. You know, she was like, well, somebody's got to take the blame and you're the oldest. And I was like, well, I wasn't even here, though. Whoa. And that don't matter. Right. right. So um, I felt like, OK, then how I how I feel about anything must not matter. Mm -hmm. So I began to not express myself in our home um, because it all it always came out misunderstood. You know, and my dad would say, why are you crying? You want if you want to cry, I'll give you a reason to cry. Come here. I'll give you a reason to cry. And so, like, I ended up taking that out into the, into the streets. Mm -hmm. And because I couldn't express that, then everybody out there is going to feel me. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, and out there, like, no, we're not talking about no feelings, bro. What are we, a bunch of girls? Mm -hmm. It's why not the breakfast like club. That, no, why but that's it? the I, perspective, I know, I understand. I'm, I understand. But I'm like, why is that? That's like the that? perspective. <laughs> and, it, and it's wrong, though. Right. Right? But, 
like girls freely talk about how they feel amongst their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Guys, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. You can't say, man, I'm scared about this or that, or like, I'm, I'm kind of sad, like. It's the man up mentality. Oh, that, that phrase is, it's kind of <laughs> sickening. Like, and my dad told me that when I got arrested in Hawaii for drug paraphernalia in my car, mm -hmm. and 11 months later, I get something in the mail, and I got to appear in court, and I'm like, oh no. And he had to appear to his commander, and he got in trouble. And he told me that if you do that again, we're all you're gonna get the whole family kick, kicked off base. Wow! And I was like, that was heavy on me. Right. And and I was like, seventeen, eight. I think I was eighteen. Mm -hmm. And um. And um. I couldn't say it, but I really just wanted him to like hug me and say it's gonna be okay. We're gonna you're gonna get through this, I'm with you. Um, and now looking back, what he was supposed to tell me was like. This isn't the life God has for you. God has a different plan and a different purpose for mm -hmm. you, and you're not walking on that journey, and we need to get you back on that path. What he told me was, don't cry now, man up. You did this, now you have to face it. Mm -hmm. And you're not a good criminal, so I think you should pick a different profession. And you know what that did to me? It made me become a better criminal. And I never got popped for dope ever again after that, but I didn't stop. Right. And matter of fact, I went in deeper. Life lesson, right? Oh, man. Praise God that I didn't get stuck in that deep end. That's a good thing. You know? Was your dad present? He was there. Was he present? Uh, I guess you're, you really are interviewing me now. <laughs> <laughs> he was emotionally unavailable. So that's like the different dynamics of fatherlessness that, mm -hmm. that we want to point out to people is it's not just about an absent father who's not in the picture, that's not there at all, or is sometimes there, but hardly. There's also fathers that are there that are emotionally unavailable to their kids. And so in their kids' eyes, they're not there. Mm -hmm. I remember watching, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, I was watching Rocky Five. Remember Rocky Five? Yep, Rocky. I love Rocky. With his son mm -hmm. in school having problems. Mm -hmm. And he's over here trying to train this other fighter and living his glory days through this, ki this, this new fighter. Right. And his son is over here getting beat up and robbed <laughs> in school. <laughs> and he's trying to get his attention. I remember walking away from that movie, and it did something to me, and it hit something in my heart that I felt like I was lost. Gotcha. And my dad wasn't there. And he wasn't noticing me and I wasn't important to him. And I remember walking down the side of this, this house. I, I can see it. I can see it right now. I would walk out our crib. This building is like this. There's a building right here. I had a walkway with all these storages mm -hmm. and the carports. And I started walking down that sidewalk. I don't remember where I was going. And when that feeling, that emotion became overwhelming, instead of crying, I just took off running. Wow. Because I couldn't cry. I, I wasn't supposed to. I'll give you a reason to cry. And that's always been in the back of your head, which understandably you passed on to your son, but at least he's young enough that it cannot continue because you're breaking chains now. Yeah, so is his mom. She recognizes, she recognizes the generational curses from mm -hmm. my family and her family. And, and she's, she's great, she's wonderful. She's helping him to learn to express when he's upset, when he's mad and give them time. Could I take a one moment to interrupt and look in the camera and let everyone know that I applaud him for actually showing up and doing the work and also your ex-wife as well for investing in your son to be better and to break generational chains so that he does not continue that when he decides to have a family and to become the father that he is to become. So I just want to take that moment just to applaud you for that. Thank you. Okay. So you're a woman of faith. Yes. And you've been doing this, this you've been doing um, this research on this topic. Mm -hmm. and, and you've been meeting with people, you talk to people in the community. Um, what are your thoughts about that, the, that concept, that phrase, generational curses, generational chains? I, I truly believe that it goes across all classes, creeds, and backgrounds. Do you think um, it's a real thing? It is a real thing. I mean, I could even give it, you know, a testimony of my own. Um, I think that our culture is somewhat similar because I grew up where corporal punishment, you got swat, you know, swat, hit, whatever, for whatever things, and being an older child, too, I understand that. 
Um, on the same token, there are certain things that sometimes you cannot be able to explain, especially emotions and like anger that comes out of nowhere sometimes. You're like, why am I feeling a certain type of way? Mm. And I just know that there are certain, for me personally, even as a mom, that I have to break for my sake, but also for my kids' sake, so it does not continue over time. Um, but I do heavily believe in generational. There's so good and bad. Yeah, it's not just... So as, as people of faith, we believe in a thing called generational chains, mm -hmm. things that get passed down through the generation, through your families. It's not just um, physical characteristics and it's attributes uh, of a person. Like, oh, you look like your daddy, or you look like your mm -hmm. mom, or you got your dad's eyes, you got mm -hmm. your mom's nose, and right. you, you know what I mean? It's, right. it's also like the, the, the stuff that they struggle with mentally, mm -hmm. um, addictions get passed on exactly like if you and if you want proof anybody you know that's addicted to drugs or alcohol is their dad or their mom addicted mm -hmm. was their grandfather addicted were their uncles addicted mm -hmm. gang banging it's the same thing with gang banging mm -hmm. like it's the this cycle gets passed down generations right and now we like we are destroying generations through the violence through addictions and and stubbornness and not getting help for those that are may not necessarily believe in that, I do also believe in cultural DNA, that there's something oh. within our genetics that is passed down over, you know, from generation to generation. And along cultural with that- Cultural DNA. Cultural DNA. Like there are studies that have actually been coming up regarding that, that within your actual genome, I'm getting like geeky here, um, in your actual trait, like DNA, that there are certain things that are passed down from generations before you. And based on like your culture mm -hmm. and the customs and the and customs heritage and of your culture. Mm -hmm. Wow, well that's crazy. Yeah. And even sometimes if you think about like when your dad and your mom or <laughs> especially like say like your dad, if he experienced something at a certain age and when you turn that age, you notice that there's something that's not right. And you're like, why am I like struggling with this? And it comes out of nowhere. I'm a big believer of that. I just can't prove it. But I just I do believe at certain times of certain ages of like my life or even my daughter's life or her son's life that they struggle with certain things. And you're like, you can't pinpoint it, but you just know that there's a struggle. So then having the tools and the tool in your tool belt to be able to give them the tools that they need that they can be better and to work through it, not around it, underneath or over it, you work through it. That's the only way through is exactly. through, right? It's through. Wow. You were just saying something, um, cultural DNA mm -hmm. and the theme of this show is cultural transformation. Mm -hmm. As you're saying that, like, I remember hearing that um, when my dad was growing up, he used to get in trouble and beat up anytime my uncle would f get into a fight and he wasn't there. Hmm. Regardless if my uncle won or lost the fight, even if he won the fight, my grandparents would get on him and whoop him for not being there because he's the old. He was the older brother and he gotcha. was supposed to be there. Gotcha. And that and that's like so that's a thing in our culture is like you're the oldest. So remember I was telling you, like, mm -hmm. I wasn't even there. How's it my fault? Well, you're the oldest. You're supposed you to be, be there. there. Like, doesn't matter. I'm supposed to know that they're... Uh, don't matter. It supposed don't matter, there. right? And that's the there. culture mm -hmm. stuff. So I'm thinking about, like, the culture in Spokane, the culture in our society around the country. Mm -hmm. um, what's the culture, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I read in a book, To Transform a City, and it said that uh, it's the city that determines the culture of his people. Not, not the church, it's the city. And what's the narrative of the city? What's the theme in the history of our city? Sure. So like I look at Spokane, I've only been here two years and it's a beautiful city and I love it. The people are awesome, the people are great. They're unique, the city is unique. I look at the city of Spokane as a beautiful woman that has a scar running down her chest. Mm -hmm and it's a deep scar mm -hmm. and it's covered by garments of beauty and uniqueness and uh, abstract and all these other components that you see about the, the city mm -hmm. is covered up so like there's issues underneath oh there's lots of issues yeah even in issues. this city and, and you don't see it and you don't normally notice it, especially if you're a tourist or you're new to the to the community to the area but it's there and it's affecting the kids like you mentioned the youth I worked with youth for Christ Jeff Ross at youth for Christ and all the kids down there like dads are just not around and if they are it's not a good situation so what is the what is the common 
theme as to why their dad's not around other than i was gonna ask you you've done the research oh i mean um, to within spokane i'm like looking at a little bit more broader you know, i feel like so one of the things i wanted to ask you was like how did you deal with whatever issues you had with your father and he wasn't there and he died when you were 16. uh anger straight as up anger. Older, as i got older you straight seem up like angry. you're free now because it took work okay <laughs> it took work it's it's a mindset a lot of it is mindset and realizing to be the bigger better um person i'm a delayed gratifier so i believe in long term and want better in the long term but knowing that you have to do a lot of work in the present so you got patience oh yes where you buy that from what <laughs> can you buy patience i would have been a gazillionaire if that was the case does, does amazon hey Vinny, does amazon sell patience <laughs> I don't know about he that. Said he don't I don't know. know. <laughs> but oh man, um, yeah, it's patience. You can ask my husband. I, I, yeah, I, I, I can wait you out. Wow, I can wait you out. Steadfast. Yep. Long suffering. Yep. So for me, both of my parents are have passed, and uh, I've learned that like the anger, the abuse, the addictions. I, I likely picked all that up from my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, depression, anxiety, codependency. My mom and they're both passing, so I can't talk to them to uh, ask any questions, get some clarification, get some closure. I, I, I have to forgive them and give them grace and understand that things happened in their life that caused them to be the way they were and that they were trying to do their best. They did their best, the best that they could. And they gave us a good life as kids, right. but like, I'm the oldest and my life is totally different. I went a whole different path than my brother and my sister. One thing that I, um, as you were talking, that came to mind is that um, I believe that you cannot fault someone for what they did not know, mm. but you can fault them for not at least trying and learning to be better. Yeah. So Say that again. You cannot fault someone for what they do not know, but you can fault them for at least not trying to be better. And awareness is something that is hard. It's something that, once again, is vulnerable. It's it's a difficult space to be in, because just like MJ said, you gotta look at that man or woman in the mirror. And doing so is the hardest thing you can do because it brings out all the ugly, the stuff all you the don't good, want to look at, all the unknowns, yeah. everything. Yeah. But once you can be able to face that person, you'd be so surprised as to what opens up and how you can transform. You promise? I promise. <laughs> I promise. And the thing is, though, too, is like even if it may not be 100% for you in this time, think about how it can be passed on so that it can rid itself of what is not needed. Yeah.